Thanks. My name is Juan Romero. I'm an associate professor of animal nutrition at the University of Maine. And today I'm going to be presenting to you this study entitled The Meta-Analysis of the Effects of Chemical and Microbial Preservatives on Hay Spoilage During Storage. Or in other words, are hay preservatives really working the way we intended to? to? And if there is any difference between chemical and microbial preservatives. So this study was part of the master's thesis of my student Marjorie Kildarby, uh, who led this study um, as part of her program. So, and now she has finished her master's and she is currently doing her, starting her PhD at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, this was also done in collaboration with Dr. Robin White from Virginia Tech, who conducted the statistical analysis, and also Diana Reyes, who was a previous master student of mine, uh, that was the one that collected the raw data and formatted it for the analysis. So, and now she's currently doing her PhD at University of New Hampshire. So, with that introduction of the authors, please let me start the presentation itself. So, um, by the way, this article, this presentation, this study has been just accepted last week by Journal of Animal Sciences. And not only that, but the editor of the journal uh, has selected it to, ha has chosen this article uh, as part of a special edition. And also an infographic will be developed from this presentation because, uh, oh, sorry, from this study because of the impact that it has and the importance that it has and the trends that it uncovered in the, uh, um, in the process of developing this, um, this experiment or this study. So let me start by, uh, by stating the effects of feed spoilage. So feed spoilage and specifically in this case, hay spoilage results in economic losses to cattle farmers and hay producers. So we have reduced animal performance, reduced animal productivity, because the animal will be consuming less of a material that has a lower nutritional value because of the spoilage processes that undesirable micros, especially molds, will carry over. So we also have health risks because the, during the process of microbial growth, especially of molds, some of the molds will produce toxins, referred as mycotoxins, which are going to have deleterious impact on the health of the animal, but also on the final consumer. So, and that is why these mycotoxins levels are going to be, for some of them, they're going to be regulated by the federal government and in Europe by a special committee over there. So, besides these effects, we also have environmental impacts because the dry matter losses that we're observing due to the spoilage of hay will basically result in the emissions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And that those car the carbon dioxide molecules will, will basically be a greenhouse gas. So, and they will contribute with to, to climate change. So and consequently, that is also going to be another impact that we're going to have because of feed spoilage. So of course, the most important impact of this feed spoilage process is that you're going to have less of the hay that costs you so much to plant, to fertilize, to, uh, to harvest, to store. So, and all of that effort, a big chunk of it can be lost due to feed spoilage if the conditions during storage are not met. So, and that is why it is very important for us to be able to understand this process and see how we can prevent it. So in basic terms, hay production is basically going to be wilting the hay to between 15 to 20%, depending if it's a large bell or a round bell. So uh, a large bell or a small bell, sorry. So the, with the smaller bells, uh, tolerating a higher moisture, so up to 20%, 20% is fine, but the larger bells are going to need for us to wield them to a lower moisture level to 15% because they have a larger mass, they will accumulate more heat, it will be 
harder for the moisture to dissipate compared to the smaller bells. So consequently, we need to wield them to a larger extent to 15% rather than 20% like the small bells. So, and this curing time needs to be no longer than five days because if we take longer than five days, we're going to have excessive nutrient losses in the field. So all of this is done basically to control microbial activity, especially microbial activity, so molds, and also to control residual plant enzymatic activity that can cause the nutrient losses too. And this is going to be especially important during the curing phase. So overall, the hay industry is the third most important crop uh, um, in the US. So contributing $18 billion each year to the US economy. So that's why it's the third most important crop in terms of value production. So, uh, and alfalfa hay is roughly half of that. So, and also uh, um, it is important to mention that in terms of acreage, hay production is typically going to be among the first in terms of acreage in the US too. So this is a very important industry that, uh, that uh, basically uh, any novel technology, any breakthrough that will allow for more efficient hay production with lower costs will have a large impact economically speaking. So let's review first the limitation of hay making. So we're talking about the moisture during storage it needs to be between 15, 20% to control the storage losses that can be up to 30% uh, if the bell is too wet, like around for instance, like if you bell it at 30% moisture, so you can have it losses up to 30%, especially if you store them outside on the ground, so the bell gets weathered. So all of that basically is going to to have heavy, a heavy impact on losses. So we can start with a thousand pound bell, but because of these high moisture conditions, then the microbes are going to be able to oxidize most of those nutrients, transform them into carbon dioxide, water, and heat. And uh, the carbon dioxide is going to be lost to the environment. The heat is going to basically cook the bell and uh, increase the insoluble nitrogen components, especially the acid detergent insoluble nitrogen, uh, which is, has zero value to the animal. So, and we're going to end up with a bell that weighs less. So we're going to end up not only with that, but also with a bell that has a lower nutritional value. So because the microbes are going to oxidize first the sugars and other non-structural carbohydrates, and they're going to leave the fiber behind, especially the recalcitrant fiber. And of course, that's something that will decrease the nutritional value of the forage. So, and on top of that, we're going to have mycotoxins that are going to be produced by certain type of molds, and uh, which can have a negative impact on the health of animals and humans. Overall, it's calculated around three billion dollars are lost only due to hay spoilage during storage each year in the U.S. But the other side of the story is going to be the losses during harvesting, which are going to be very, very important in the case of hay production. So. We're talking that when we bale hay below 15% moisture, we're going to start having very, very large field losses. So more than 20% uh, uh, dry matter losses in the field due to leaf shattering because leaves are going to be very brittle. And when we are manipulating the swath below 15% moisture, we're going to have very significant losses. So of course, that's not something that we want. So consequently, then um, um, it is very important that we also think about this. So we have an uh, uh, overall picture of hay production. So if we imagine that we have a low cost, very effective hay preservative that can allow us to bail above 20% moisture without having to worry of storage losses, it will not only control the storage losses, it will not only prevent that, it will also automatically, automatically reduce field losses because the weather the bell while being manipulating in the field, the less leaf losses we're going to experience. And this is especially true with legumes. So which typically like alfalfa are going to have a higher price. So then consequently, if we are to develop a technology that can allow us to build more wet without worrying about loss in storage, it will have a double impact. It will, will, will have a double win, not only preventing losses in storage, 
but also reducing automatically the losses during harvest. And this will be a game changer in the hay industry. But before getting into that next generation type of preservative, we need to first understand what's the current situation of the hay preservatives in the US so we can then basically uh, uh, have a better understanding of the overall situation and take the right decisions. So among hay preservatives, the most popular are going to be the organic acids. So many of them are going to be antimicrobial, like for instance, propionic acid, acetic acid, formic acid, and so on. But however, by their own nature, by being acids, they're going to be corrosive. They're going to be hazardous to handle. So, and consequently, those are negative aspects are going to be of great concern. That is why many years ago, buffer organic acids were developed. So they're going to be basically organic acids that have been neutralized with alkalis, like sodium hydroxide, ammonium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, to form salts. So like ammonium propionate, sodium propionate, calcium propionate, sodium diacetate, and so on. So which are going to be less corrosive, but also going to be less antifungal in most cases. So uh, because organic acids are going to be more antimicrobial with a lower P at a lower pH relative to a higher pH. And this is something that has been demonstrated many times in the literature. So it has to do with the ability of the molecule to penetrate the membrane of the microbe is going to be higher when it's going to be, the acid is going to be protonated, so undissociated. So it's going to be able to penetrate better the membrane and affect the microbe more. So, uh, but, but, the salt, the alkali that is used to neutralize the acid is very important for, for instance, in the unique case of ammonium propionate, that ammonium molecule is also antifungal. So in the case of ammonium propionate, there are studies in the lab that demonstrate that it actually has a higher antimicrobial activity than propionic acid, but surprisingly, no field studies have been conducted to compare propionic acid and ammonium propionate. So, uh, and this should be something that needs to be addressed. So because uh, it will be an important step in the right direction. So uh, since the buffer salts are easier to handle, they're also going to be less volatile. So, uh, but unfortunately that study is a study that needs to be conducted. We have submitted grants uh, to, to be able to answer that question. And hopefully we can run those studies in the future. So we also have anhydrous ammonia. So that has been used extensively to increase the forage quality of uh, of straws, of low quality forages, but also the ammonia, like I just explained, has antifungal activities. So it has been assessed as a preservative too. So, but there are much less studies for, for, uh, for the utilization of anhydrous ammonia as a preservative. But the problem with anhydrous ammonia is it's expensive, is hazardous to handle, requires special equipment and experience. So urea has been uh, suggested as an alternative, but urea transformation into ammonia because urea will be broken down by ureases and then transformed into ammonia. Uh, that transformation step is not very efficient. It depends on many conditions and usually it doesn't, uh, it's not as effective as anhydrous ammonia itself, but is less hazardous to handle than anhydrous ammonia. Finally, we have the microbial inoculants. So include like things like lactic acid bacteria, which are supposed to produce antifungal compounds and then control undesirable microbes. But their efficacy in hay production has been questioned over the years. So, and this is something that needs to be answered. So we're all, we don't know basically how effective these preservatives are overall across a diverse set of conditions. And that is why we want to include, do a, we wanted to perform this meta-analysis to quantitatively analyze the results uh, because this has never been done. So not even a review paper has been done on hay preservatives. So it's time, to be able to answer this question considering the scale of the hay industry in the US and worldwide. So the objective was to basically summarize all these studies using a meta-analysis approach to assess the effects of preservatives of, uh, on, hay, on, on hay preservation during storage. So a total of 62 articles were gathered from the literature, 50 articles uh, were used for chemical preservatives and two new articles were used for microbial preservatives. So because of the application rate units were different between chemical and microbial preservatives, we assess the chemical preservatives separately 
because we were very interested in assessing the effect of application rate, but uh, microbial preservatives, we couldn't do that. So they have a different type of unit. So usually it's look log CFU per gram, but even that is not consistent across the studies. There were not enough studies to be able to assess application rate uh, uh, of microbial preservatives. Um, so basically we use a statistical software to analyze these studies. So, and as variables of interest in the model, we selected, of course, preservative class that will allow us to, to assess if there is any difference between preservatives. So and for that, we needed to classify the preservatives in the studies. So the first obvious choice was a category for propionic acid alone. So all the studies measure is that use only propionic acid. So then we have a buffer organic acid category, which includes studies that assess single and mixed buffer organic acid commercial preparations. So we will have love to, uh, to assess for instance, ammonium propionate separately, but there were not enough studies with ammonium propionate alone. And consequently, we have to compile all the buffer organic acids together, okay, because of, of, of limitations in the data set. So and many commercial preparations are actually complex mixtures anyway. So then we have another category, other organic acids, which basically includes preparations consisting of formic, acetic, lactic acid, and complex mixtures which is basically you know, everything else that is an organic acid that did not fall in the previous two categories. So the, uh, the other two are urea and hydrosome of the other two categories for preservative classification, which will be abbreviated as PC. Okay, every time you see PC, it means preservative classification effects. Then we have forest type, which will be abbreviated as FT, forest type effects. So, and here we had grasses, legumes, and mixtures of grasses and legumes. We were interested in seeing if there were any differences between these categories. I'm, I'm very glad that we did. So then we have the application rate effects. Of course, we wanted to see is putting more of the preservatives having a benefit. And in the case of moisture concentration, which we have read as MC, we were interested to see what, were the, what was the performance of that preservatives across a gradient of moisture in the bells. So all of these we included for the chemical preservatives, but for the microbial preservatives, we couldn't because of the limitation of the data set, I mentioned that we couldn't do application rate for microbial preservatives. Uh, and basically we also couldn't subdivide uh, like we did for the chemical preservatives, the microbial preservatives, because there were basically too few studies and, um, and most of them were actually lactic acid bacteria based. So consequently we did not do a, uh, preservative classification for the microbial inoculants. So they were all lumped together, okay? So response variables of interest during storage include dramatic losses during storage, sugars, visual moldiness, hay maximum temperature, in vitro digestibility, and acid detergent, so nitrogen, all of these were assessed and will be presented uh, in the, uh, today. So, and one thing that is very important for us to keep in mind to understand these results is that what I'm going to be presenting to you is the predicted difference, meaning is the treated minus untreated. So, and, and the, if, 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 if the value is negative or positive, the interpretation if that is benefit, beneficial or deleterious will depend on the variable. And because of that complexity, each time I will present you a response variable, I will tell you if negative is good, more negative is good, or more positive is good, or if more negative is bad, and so on. Okay, I will let you know the benefits of a certain direction in the response. So let's start first with the chemical preservatives. So this will only be about the chemical preservatives first, okay, and then we'll check the microbial preservatives. So this is the first response variable, their mother loss, the most important. Um, basically, every slide you're going to see on the bottom left corner, the effect, the significant effects. In this case, it was significant, the preservative class and application rate interaction. So the consequently, and then that's what I'm going to present to you, but we are only doing this for polynic acid because it was the only one that had enough data points to be able to assess this. So in the case of their mother loss, the more negative the difference is the better. Why is that? Because if you see the equation at the bottom right corner, that is predicted difference in this case is treated and minus untreated. If the treated 
is if, if, if the treated hay has less than mother losses relative to the untreated, then the more negative the number, the better, right? So, and that's basically what we're going to follow up here. So we're seeing that as we increase application rate of, of propenic acid, we are actually seeing a benefit of having less and less dramatic losses relative to one treatment, which is excellent, right? So, and that's basically the first result that we observe in terms of dramatic losses. So what about moisture effects? So for moisture effects on dramatic losses, we could only do this for other organic acid. It was the only one that had enough data points across a moisture range. And what we observe is that as we increase moisture concentration, the benefits of apply, ap applying other organic acids is reduced. So, because remember, for the mother loss, the more negative the differences, the better. So basically above 25% moisture, the benefits of applying other organic acid disappear, as you can see in the graph, and that's, of course, something that is not going to be good. So, but this is only apply. This only can be said about organic acids, and uh, and this was done as point sensitive. This for, for obtaining this curve, we had to fix application rate at 075 percent. So, um, and that's something that we have to keep in mind too. Also, very interestingly, we observe that, and if an interaction between forage type and preservative class. So, um, because propenic acid was the only one that had enough data points in mixtures, legumes and grasses at the same time, that's the one I'm going to be presenting here. So we see that the grasses are responding much better to propenic acid, because remember the more negative the difference for their mother loss, the better, because it means that the treated grass, their mother loss was way, most, way smaller than the untreated grass value, okay, for their mother loss. So that's great for grasses, but then for legumes, we're seeing that the legume actually is, there is not going to be any benefit. It's, there is a slight increase actually in their mother loss. So uh, that's of course something that is undesirable. So, but we have to keep in mind that for me to generate this graph, I have to fix application rate at 1%. So all of them are at the same application rate and the same moisture concentration in the model, okay? So what we suspect that, that is going on here is that the legume forage needs a higher application rate relative to grasses in order to match the, the effects of the preservatives of surfing grasses. So, and that's something that we need to keep in mind. So, because right now extension documents and company literatures, they don't make any distinction between grasses and legumes or mixtures. So, and consequently, you can end up in a situation when you are over applying preservatives or under applying preservatives, depending on the degree of mixture between grasses and legumes in your head. So this is something that is very important to be mind. Keep in mind, this is the first time that somebody has uncovered this, okay? So you are among the first people, first producers, you know that you are the first producers that are seeing this, okay? And like I said, this has been reviewed extensively, not only by faculty at University of Maine that were part of the committee of Marjorie, but also by the Journal of Animal Sciences. So uh, in their review process, they review all the manuscript. And also we have the silage uh, group meetings where we presented this and also our colleagues that are familiar in this case with the silage literature and silage experiments also observe this and provide their comments about our results. So basically what we speculated, um, well, let me first give you some background, okay? So, I was talking about what we I show you are responsiveness to preservatives, okay? But there are some previous authors, so like Dr. Collins, uh, many years ago, he speculated that legumes are more susceptible to spoilage than grasses, okay? And one of the reasons that he provided is that legumes have typically a higher nutritional value than grasses, okay? So among that, nutrients that are, that are highly nutritious, that are in higher proportions in legumes versus grasses, we find proteins, we have pectins, and we have ashes. And all of those are going to be compounds that have a high buffering capacity, okay? So that is why legumes have a higher buffering capacity than grasses. 
Buffering capacity is the ability to resist pH, meaning that legumes are harder to acidify relative to grasses. We need to put more acid to a legume to achieve the same level of pH in a grass. So, and this is widely known in the silage industry. We know that legumes are harder to ensile because they have a higher buffering capacity. So more acid needs to be produced during the fermentation process to be able to acidify the legume to the same extent as the grass. So that's something that is widely known in silage studies. And there is no reason why the same thing applies for hay because when we're applying to hay, the preservatives are organic acids. We're applying propionic acid, we're applying acetic acid. And consequently, those acids will be neutralized by the natural alkalis or salts that are going to be present in the legume. So, and they're going to neutralize those basic, those positive charges that are going to be in the legume. They're going to neutralize the negative charges in the acid molecule and then are going to form salts, okay? So that's naturally expected. So the pH of a forage is typically between 5.5 and 6. Consequently, most of the propionic acid that you will be applying to a legume will actually be in the salt form, as you can see in this graph, so which is presenting dissociation of propionic acid across a gradient of pH. So propionic acid is the blue line. So um, we do know that when the propionic acid is in his, in his undissociated form, meaning that is protonated, is going to be more antimicrobial than the propionic acid that is in its salt form, meaning that is dissociated. So we know that we, there are reports in the literature, we have done the experiments too. So, and there's a very, very good, uh, a very good hypothesis on why the dunes are being less responsive to grasses, to preserve it, to, relative to grasses, to preservatives. So, uh, and this opinion was also arrived independently by Dr. Kang from the University of Delaware when we showed him the data in our silage meetings. Basically, he also concluded the same as us that the buffering capacity is what is driving this responsiveness. Okay. So, indirectly, too, Dr. Koblenz has observed what Dr. Collins speculated many years ago that grasses are going to be less susceptible to its polish than legumes. And he showed this in this graph. So in this case, is dramatic recovery, the variable, the, the, the variable that is being measured. So which is 100 minus the matter loss. And basically on the x-axis, we have the heating degree days, but this is not the heating degree days of the environment. This is the heating degree, degree days of the bell. So this in very simple terms is how much heat has accumulated in the bell, and the heat can only come from spoilage processes. So the more heat there is, the more spoiled is the forage. Okay. So, but at, at any given heating degree days of the bell, we can see that the dramatic recovery in alfalfa is much lower than the Bermuda grass, and this basically is one of the the uh, the data uh, um, results that help us to kind of see that legumes are special relative to grasses. They're, they behave differently. So it seems that they are more subject to spoilage, but also they are less responsive to preservatives, okay? But this can only be addressed in an experiment where you have the two together under the same conditions and, and basically everything is controlled except the preservative itself. So but these experiments have never been conducted surprisingly. And we have submitted uh, uh, projects to the USDA to answer this question. And hopefully in the future, I will have an answer for you about this. So visual moldiness is another variable that is measured very frequently in the hay industry. So in this case, what we observe is that the anhydrous ammonia, propionic acid, other organic acids, and buffer organic acids, they are do decreasing the, the visual moldiness because here, the more negative differences, the better. So visual moldiness is decreasing significantly by all of these uh, um, preservatives. So that's good. But because the, of the nature of the visual moldiness data, we could not assess interactions. So it had to be a simple model. I wish we could have done the comparison of, uh, between the human grasses for visual moldiness, but 
it wouldn't be statistically responsible for doing that. We want to be conservative in the way we are approaching this. So consequently, basically the, what we can tell you is that the, the preservatives are due decreasing the visual moldiness in hay when applied relative to untreated. So what about maximum temperature in the bell? So this is the peak temperature in the bell. So the hotter means the larger the spoilage. So we observe a forest type application rate interaction. And, and we observe that actually mixed forages when treated are going to have less maximum temperatures relative to untreated mixes. So, uh, so they're going to have less heating when you apply the preservatives to mix haze. So relative to legumes, the preservatives are going to be able to prevent to a lesser extent heating in the legumes relative to mixtures. As we can see in this graph, because the more negative differences, the better. So with mixtures, when we treat them, we can decrease the maximum temperature to a greater extent than what we can do to legumes. And this is re reinforcing what we just been discussing about the differences between grasses and uh, and, and legumes. In this case, we cannot present you the grass curve because there were not enough studies for grasses, but we have the mixture uh, curve and the mixture curve is even, you know, more responsive than the legume curve that we saw also for others. I can only imagine where the grass one would be. It would be even lower. So then, you know, uh, that, that's the importance of the, doing these studies to be able to, to answer these questions. So, but definitely there is a differences between legume and mixtures and definitely will be true for the grasses too. So in regards to sugars, sugars, the more positive the differences, the better. Because if you have a treated hay, it should have a more sugar concentration than the untreated hay. The treated hay should have less sugars because those sugars are being consumed by the microbes. So consequently, more positive, the better for sugars. We see that by using propionic acids, other organic acids and both organic acids, we can increase that sugar level. And these are percentage points, okay? These are percentage points. And considering that sugars concentrations in, in, in hay range between five, 12, I mean, this is a, these, are, these are significant increases, benefits. So of having uh, the utilizing preservatives in order to preserve more sugars. And this was done for BOA at application rate of 1%. For other organic acid, it was 0.4% and propionic acid was 0.4%, meaning that if you increase the dose for other organic acid and propionic acid, well, it will have more sugars being preserved because 0.4% is a quite low dose, but that was the median dose in the data set for sugars, okay? So that's why we're choosing those. So because they are in the middle. So, also, we observe differences between legumes and grasses for sugar levels. So the grasses are being more responsive, more sugars are being preserved, protected in grasses relative to legumes. And of course, that's reinforcing what we observed before too. So um, definitely legumes are going to need probably more um, higher application rate than grasses to have the same responses. So in this case, the application rate was fixed between the human grasses, both of them, the application rate was 1.1%. So that's why if you were to increase the application rate, then you will get, uh, uh, you will start actually having a better response in the humans. But basically that means that, that we cannot use the same doses for grasses and legumes. The legumes need to have a higher dose, but that needs to be determined in the field. If, uh, as long as nobody does that study, then, you know, uh, uh, that answer cannot be uh, provided. We need to have a field study in order to, to, uh, to observe what, how, how the preservatives are working in grasses relative to legumes. In vitro acidity, again, the same thing, more positive differences, the better. We see the grasses are responding better than the legumes at the same application rate, 0.83%. So uh, definitely, you know, there is, Kind of, they kind of have the same application rates between legumes and grasses if you want to preserve more of the digestible nutrients. So uh, the acid deuterium soluble nitrogen is that component uh, of the protein fraction that is undigestible 
And consequently, we want to have the lowest amount possible of this aiding fraction. So in this case, then the more negative difference is the better because if the treated hay has less aiding than the untreated, then the number, the more negative it is, the difference then will be the better. So what we are serving here is that we increase the moisture concentration for both propionic acid and other organic acids, we are seeing that there is a more benefit of using the preservative. So at a higher moisture, it makes more sense to use even more sense to use the preservative because the untreated hay, it went bad, went very bad for because for aiding to form, aiding is generated by the mylar reaction, which means that the bell had, had to heat to above 60 degrees Celsius at some point to be able to generate that uh, level of acid terrain soluble nitrogen. So then that means that that untreated bell is spoiled very badly. When we, but if you use that preservative, either OA or propionic acid, then you're going to mitigate, you're going to lessen significantly that uh, aiding level, okay? So uh, in the case of application rate and preservative class for other organic acids, we have enough data points to see that if you increase application rates of other organic acids, you can actually also have a, a, a more benefit in terms of reducing the levels of acid determining soluble nitrogen because the more negative the difference is the better. So then you have the benefit of increasing the dose, more responsiveness of the other organic acids, more protection of the protein fraction. What about the microbial inoculants? Here we're going to change shifts and we're going to look to the other data set. So all of them we're going to be presenting from now on is going to be about the microbial inoculants, okay? But it's going to be brief because the microbial inoculants have very limited effects. That's the main message, okay? So there are mother laws, there were no effects of using microbial inoculants for visual moldiness. The effects are limited. So, and when you start getting above 25% moisture, then they disappear for both legume and mixtures. So, a mixed hay. So basically, uh, the, one of the reasons why to use preservatives is precisely because we want to preserve nutrients at high moisture concentration, but if the inoculant is not going to like high moisture concentrations in hay, then was, you know, the, the, the justification of using it is going to be decreased. Okay, so in the case of maximum temperatures, the same as we increase the moisture concentration, uh, especially about 25%, then the benefit of, uh, in the case of legumes, of using a preservative and inoculant, in this case is microbial inoculant, all of this is microbial inoculant, is unjustified because it disappears, right? About 25%, the microbial inoculant is not going to have a benefit in, in preventing an increase of maximum temperature. In the case of sugars, the more positive differences, the better. So we see the inoculants, when applied to grasses, they're going to preserve more sugar relative to the legumes. So the same thing we observe with the chemical preservatives. And to wrap up everything. So now let's go over the conclusions. So overall, the organic acid-based preservatives, including propionic acid, buffer organic acids, and other organic acids are effective at preventing haze polish, but propionic acid seems to be more consistent and doing it at a greater extent. So unfortunately for some variables, um, there were not enough data points to, to, uh, to assess the effects of anhydrous ammonia and urea. So, and that is why we couldn't present them for every variable that we covered. So, and in the case of microbial inoculants, they seem to have limited effects on hay preservation and those that they have seem to be lost when moisture levels go over 25%. So also, and this is one of the most important conclusions of this study, the hymn haze seem to be much less responsive to microbial and chemical preservatives relative to what we see, how grasses and mixtures with legumes respond when treated with chemical and microbial preservatives. So, and this is something that we believe that should be um, evaluated in future research. No field studies have been published in this regard. Um, 
propionic acid versus ammonium propionate comparisons too should be conducted. There's also no field studies exist evaluating these two and ammonium propionate because it has that ammonium group is an interesting option to propionic acid. So macular inoculants also we should assess other microbes besides lactic acid bacteria, like for instance, bacillus that are more tolerant of dry conditions and have shown to have some antifungal properties. So, and also in order to improve the consistent phase experiments, we need to find strategies to be able to deal with unexpected rain events during studies that occur with a concerning frequency and that, uh, that affect the results of a given study because of confounding the confounding effect of rain. So we should need to develop new ways, new approaches to do hay studies so we can uh, control for those unexpected events. So thank you to, to, for your time. So uh, if you have any questions, please email me. That's my email. So, um, and well, I will open, be open to questions during the session. So, and thanks to all of you, have a great day. I apologize for any noise. Uh, um, right now I am helping my mother to solve some issues. So, and her house is right in the, uh, in a runabout with heavy traffic and there is quite a bit of noise. So I hope that was not too distracting. Thanks a lot for your time and have a good one, bye.